think about freedom, it does take people to different places. And I try to think back of when was my first real taste of freedom. When did I experience the first um, bout of just all-out freedom? And the answer is when I went to college. <laughs> when I went away to college. I went all the way up to Michigan Tech, a good nine-hour drive from here. Um, and um, I have a sweet, loving mother who, who um, definitely pampered me and took care of me throughout my high school years, but no offense to her, I couldn't wait to just get out there and see the world, right? And uh, when, when you go to college, man, it's like spread your wings. I wanted to meet people, and by people I mean girls, all right? I'm not going to lie and sugarcoat it, all right? I wanted to play basketball, and I wanted to get my degree, right? That was important. Those are the two things that I cared about. And um, when I was there at Michigan Tech for four years, I really didn't think about God. There was a church on the hill between my dorm room and the basketball gym, and I did go there once, I believe, my freshman year, and that was about it in terms of thinking about God during my college years. There's so much to do in college, so much to think about. Um, I don't think it's changed. I know it's only been a couple years since I got out of college. You can probably tell um, by how young I look and all, but um, things haven't really changed much. I think that people go away to college and they really just want to discover themselves, discover the world, and, and there's a lot of things to do oftentimes in college. And um, God tends to get put in this little corner. You know, maybe if I go home for the holidays, I might, or the summer, you know, I might go to church with my parents, went to church, but it's not too often. God is, is important to a person in college. In fact, I think it's very much the minority. So God is not really in the picture oftentimes in the colleges today, which is why I believe the book of Colossians is so important. Because I really think it speaks to bright young minds that we have today that are going off to college and wanting to learn. and They're in search of knowledge. We have a lot of bright young minds in search of knowledge, and they think that they're going to find it in college. Am I right? I mean, you see this. I mean, some of you have just graduated from college. You know what I'm talking about. It's not been that long. Okay, I know. I told you for me, it's not been that long at all. All right, but I do have a title a screen for you here. This is what I call this message, Colossians for College. All right, because you may or may not um, have been in college, gone to college, or, or been there recently, but you know somebody that has. You have an aunt, or excuse me, a, a niece, a nephew, a child, a grandchild, you have somebody you know that's in college or actually in high school as well because we see this happening in high schools today as well. And um, ultimately, um, I sort of dedicate this message to those that are experiencing um, college and high school and um, really um, philosophies that they're being presented with. So with that being said, will you pray with me for, for, for all of us to hear this message with our, our hearts and our minds. Father. God, speak to us today through your Holy Spirit, through me, through your word. Help us to understand what Colossians is teaching us, what you spoke through Paul. Um, you moved in him. Your Holy Spirit moved in him. And, and, and he wrote down this letter, and he wrote it to this little city in Colossians called Colossae and, and, and to these Colossian people. But yet today, 2,000 years later, we read it and it still matters. It's still the living word from you. God, teach us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. So there's only four chapters in Colossians. It's a book you can read often, regularly. Um, it kind of follows the same pattern that Paul um, uses when he writes a letter. Paul wrote a lot of the um, we call them epistles, these church letters to these churches that he either went to or, or heard about that were these young churches. And so Paul writes this letter to this church in Colossae, and it follows this pattern of, um, I'm going to introduce myself, I'm going to pray for you, intercession, and then, because I know what's going on in your church, I'm going to give you a teaching. I'm going to teach you the truth, so you know what the truth is. And then the part we all love, the application. How do I apply this to my life? Okay, I'm very much um, one who likes to preach um, a message that you can take and, and apply it to your life. Right? I, and to me, I, the Bible isn't here to inform you. It's here to transform you. 
And I want to see that happen in your life. So, Paul writes this letter, probably wrote it actually from prison. He was in prison because he was sharing his faith, and that got him in trouble in the Roman world at that time. So he probably also wrote um, Ephesians at this time, a letter to Ephesus, which actually isn't very far from Colossae. If you look at a map, when you go home, you can Google it pretty quickly. You'll find that Ephesians was right on the Mediterranean Sea, which was a... Um, a place that Paul preached and started a church, and the reason why is because that's where people went, right? They stopped there. Um, it was a very much a busy place. Colossae, not so much anymore. It was kind of inland, far, not, not far, but far enough away from the sea. But, but the main city, if you were living in Colossae and you wanted to go to a place where everybody was at, you wanted to go shopping, girls, okay, I'll just give you something you can relate to, all right? You wanted to go shopping at the big mall, all right, um, then you would, go to, if he, you would go to Ephesus, okay, if you were living in Colossae. So he writes these two letters about the same time. What, what, you read this, right? Many of us are reading the whole Bible in a year, and this is why we're doing this. I'm preaching through each of these books. And if you read it, what kind of church did you picture in Colossae? Like, was this a house church? Was it a, a, a small church building like ours, you know, where maybe 50 to 100 people gather to, um, to hear a message and sing songs? Or was this a mega church that they had this big, giant coliseum or something where people would gather in the thousands and, and they would preach amplified, you know, messages? I don't know. What do you picture? I mean, we don't have the answer to that. Um, I'm sure some um, scholars and archaeologists could could probably tell you what the church in Colossae was like. Um, but uh, there's other questions I'm sure you have when you look at this and say, like, for example, how did it begin? Because you find out pretty quickly that Paul didn't start this church. Even though he was a church planter, he started a lot of churches in his mission trips around the Mediterranean Sea. He didn't actually start this church. There's a different person who started this church, which we'll get to. But why even start a church? Sometimes... We ask that question even today. Like, aren't there enough churches in St. Clair Shores? Why did Life of Purpose Church start? It's in 2005 when we began, 15 years ago. Why did we start? Why did somebody start a church? Well, the quick answer to that, um, just so you know, is, is that this church started as a Southern Baptist church start. And Southern Baptists believe that in order to reach the world for Jesus, right, to obey Acts 1.8, which is to be my witness, right? Jesus said, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem's like St. Clair Shores, right? Judea, Samaria, like Macomb County, Michigan. Keep going, right? In order to do that, they believe that you should start new churches. That, that, that brings people um, into a, a place where they can hear the gospel and become a Christian. And so a lot of people believe in that. Starting a church is an interesting endeavor, Jamie and I, my wife and I, have started uh, helped start two churches, this one and uh, a previous one when we first were married. It's a fun endeavor, really is. The first year of a church beginning, it's exciting. You know, it's like the honeymoon, right, of a wedding, uh, a marriage. You know, it, it, everything's exciting and new, and you're starting establishing some traditions, if you will, and laying down some roots and such. And it, it can be fun. Um, but it can also be challenging. Um, church planning should have the uh, mindset of not, well, we got to think about the building and employees and the organization. That's not church planning. That's not what it should be about, even though some do focus on that. It should be about the ecclesia, the Greek word for church in the Bible. The Greek word is ecclesia. It means the assembly of God's people. It should be about God's people. It should be us obeying the Great Commission to go and make disciples. So I believe that's why this church began. And we continue that. And I try to remind us and we come back to that. We, why did we start this church? Why are we here? Why are we, why are we doing this for 15 years now? Because we believe in the Great Commission. We believe we should go and make disciples. We believe we should share the love of Jesus Christ to the community and beyond. Right? That is the goal. That is what we're doing. That's why we're doing it. Now, why did the church in Colossae start? Well, there was a young man named Epaphras. That's his nickname. His full name is Epaphroditus. But I don't think they could pronounce that very well. So he 
shortens it up. Paul doesn't calls him Epaphras. All right, and Epaphras is much in my the reason why I asked Logan to come up here and share a little bit about himself and introduce himself is because when I looked at Epaphras, I thought of Logan. I thought here's a young man who's on fire for God. I mean, he is he is he is eating up the scriptures. And see, what I believe happened is that Epaphras was living in Colossae, traveled to Ephesus, because that's where everybody went, right? If, it, if you were a young man, you want to know what's happening, right? You want to go paint the town red, as they say? Do they say that anymore? Well, okay. No, shaking your head, the young people. All right. He went to Ephesus, and he met a guy named Paul preaching in a guy's uh, house, Tyrannus, and uh, for two years Paul was there. And Epaphras heard the gospel, and he got saved. He heard the, the gospel that says that the only justification for your sins is Jesus Christ. And he said, I want that. I want to be a Christian. I want to go to heaven. And he received Christ. He was born again. And he didn't hide that. He went home, and he shared that with his family and friends. And I believe this church started organically, really. Just, he went home, he shared his faith with his parents, probably his friends. And the next thing you know, he's having a Bible study or a church service, whatever you want to call it, in his home, right? And then 20 people are all in there crammed up on a Sunday, and they said, hey, you know that building, no one's using it on the corner right there. Why don't we go rent that building out and we can uh, gather more people together? Or maybe it didn't work like that. Maybe they said, hey, we got so many people in this house. How about if we do this again at your house and then we'll do it in all kinds of different houses? We had this, who knows how this began. But ultimately, they put a sign out somewhere that said, Colossi Christian Church meets here. And this church began because of Epaphras, a young man who was on fire for God. And I want to tell you something. You heard Logan come up here and talk a little bit. And you know, all right, he, he, does, he doesn't hide the fact that he has a, a stuttering problem and that's a weakness that Moses had. And when God gets a hold of someone who doesn't care about their weakness and is willing to, to step out in faith, God can do amazing things. Amazing things. And I look forward to seeing what God will do with Logan because of his willingness to serve Him. Serve yes. Him. Amen. So this church started by Epaphras was doing pretty well, but they did have a problem. There was uh, an issue. It's the same issue we have in churches today. There were some false teachers. There were some very influential men and women that were coming in with these immature Christians because they didn't have a Paul that was preaching to them. Right? They had a young Christian, Epaphras himself, and they were steering these people away from the truth of God's word. And they were doing it for their own gain. i give you just kind of an example of, of human nature, if you will. I use my son as an example. He doesn't know I'm going to do this, and he's probably going to be mad at me that I'm doing this. But he has an account on TikTok, all right, if you understand what that is. If you're not, it's a clock. It's not a clock. I'm just kidding. It's, it's something. It's social media, okay? And he has an account on TikTok, and he figured out a way that he can really multiply his followers, okay? And I'm telling you, you should see his face light up when he found out that he went, from like, overnight from, like, a couple followers to 200 followers, and then he keeps checking it, and the next thing you know, it's 300, and then it's 400 followers, and you know what? He can't wait. His goal is to get to 1,000 followers because if he gets to 1,000 followers, he's going to get into some kind of creator mode. I don't understand it all, okay? I'm 47 years old. I don't have a TikTok account, all right? But he wants that. He wants followers ultimately for his own gain so he can get into this creator mode. Now you think about that. You apply that nature of us, us as humans to these false teachers in Colossae. They want people to follow them, not because they're giving God glory, because they want the glory for themselves. That's what was going on. That was the issue in Colossae. And there were some isms that were taking place. We name these things with the ending 
ism and the biggest issue in classy was gnosticism now there were other issues like legalism and aestheticism and mysticism and syncretism all right and i'm not going to get too philosophical or too deep on you this morning but i'm just going to share with you what what's happening in this church that these in this town and these teachers these false teachers we're trying to steer these people away. Get them to follow them. No, you don't want to follow him. You want to follow me. You don't want to belong to a classy Christian church. You want to come belong to me and hear what I have to say. Gnosticism is the root word gnosis, and that means, anyone? Knowledge. knowledge. Very good. So knowledge. And you read Colossians, you'll see that word will pop up. Now, what's interesting about that word Gnosis, as we'll get to it, as Paul uses a little different form of the word gnosis, and I'll explain that in a minute. But gnosis means knowledge. And you see, here's the bottom line. I'm trying to sum it up for you so I don't really get, lose you. I don't want to lose you, okay? So here's the deal. People believe, some believe, that if they got a special knowledge from God, and they thought they would get that from worshiping angels, a special knowledge from God. If they had that special knowledge, if you have that special knowledge, you can just imagine them saying that to someone in the street. And I've had this, someone say that to me before, even in the Christian um, realm, say to me, you know, um, you've been a Christian, but have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? I'm like, what are you talking about? Why would I need to be baptized? I, I've been, I'm born again. I have the Holy Spirit. Why do I need to be well, again, this is my point in just saying, they were like, you need this special knowledge, and then you'll be in there. You'll be pleasing God. Wrong. But that's Gnosticism. Okay? Legalism, we talked about that last week in Galatians. Legalism were these people coming in, they were Jewish, and they said, no, you can't be a Christian and not be circumcised. You've got to get circumcised, physically circumcised. And you can't be a Christian if you don't obey the law. You've got to obey the law. Right? These Judaizers were going in and doing that. That's legalism. Of course, we see legalism in churches today, right? They, they take something from the Bible that God says you shouldn't do because it's not good for you, and they abuse it. Legalism. But that's not the answer. Then there was aestheticism. Okay, Now, aestheticism is basically, in a nutshell, self-denial, total self-denial, self-discipline, and really, ultimately, self-humiliation. That's aestheticism, self-humiliation, and um, that will, uh, if you do all of that, that will please God. Wrong. Then there is mysticism. Mysticism, as you can kind of picture, is the um, idea of trying to obtain some sort of higher religious enlightenment through meditating and, and having different levels of consciousness. Mysticism. Wrong. Syncretism is the blending of philosophy and religion. And there were those who I'm sure were followers of um, some of the great philosophers of the, of the day and of the past. So you have these isms that are a serious problem in the church. They're affecting Christians. Okay? And the Colossian Christian church had to battle them. Which is why I believe this is so important for young people in high school and in college, to understand what's coming at them. What's coming at you? Okay? It's important to know that. Where in our country are the most philosophers, idealists, isms taking place? To me, that answer is simple. It's in college. Professors, high school teachers. Okay? They're, they're, they all have very strong opinions, and they have platforms, folks. They got platforms. They get to get up in front of kids all day long, young people, right? And they get to speak their mind. And young people, right, from ages like 14, 15, all the way up, right, mid-20s or so, they're forming their worldview for the rest of their life, most likely. Right? And they're soaking it all in. Now, college, I'm not saying it has to be this terrible experience. I'm not, I'm not telling you that. It can be a very positive experience. Okay? There are Christian colleges, all right? Um, but there are colleges that have really good people and high schools that have good professors and so on, Christian people. But the majority is not. 
we need to be open and understanding to that and understand that. So you can have a positive experience, but you can also have a very damaging experience. So here's the point that I'm trying to get to. If you have a child in college or high school, or you have a niece or a nephew or someone, you need to pray for them. You need to pray for them, and you need to have conversations with them. You need to talk with them, and you need to see where they're at. When you pray for them, it would be a good idea to pray this prayer that Paul prayed in Colossians. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, 10, and 11, it's part of the prayer that Paul prayed for this church. He prays for them on verse 9. I'll bring this up on the screen for you to see. He says, from the day we heard about you, because remember, Paul never been there, but he says, the day we heard about you from Epaphras, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge. Now, Paul uses the word epinosis, which really means full knowledge. That you would understand the whole story. You would get the whole bit of knowledge you need of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So you can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and you can increase in this epinosis, this full knowledge of God. And then in verse 11 being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. From this prayer, I see two things you can pray for. If you know someone in college or high school and you want to pray for them, or you are in high school or college, or, or you're still forming your worldview, you can even pray for yourself. Two things. Full knowledge and power. And not just any power. Resurrection power, as we're going to see here. This is what Paul is talking about here. So let me just begin with knowledge. He, he knows Gnosticism is the issue in this church. And um, he knows that there are um, other isms going on. He wants them to have the correct knowledge. So here comes his teaching. Paul always brings a teaching right, in his letter. In the letter, in this letter, he says in verses 15 through 20 of chapter 1, it's called the preeminence of Christ. Okay, the preeminence. Now, I will explain that in a second. Verse 15, though, I want to read it to you because sometimes when you just hear the word of God, okay, the Holy Spirit has a way of taking the word of God and changing your life. Okay, more so than what I could ever say, the word of God. So here is, Paul writes, that He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Matter of fact, there's a message I preached a while back about if you want to see um, God, you just need to look at Jesus, because he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Jesus is before all things. In him all things hold together. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. For in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. Jesus made peace by his blood on this cross. Today, amen is right. Today, if you were to get a visit from a Jehovah's Witness, knocking on your door, or maybe you've ever talked with a Jehovah's Witness, then you would um, see that they would use this text, actually, to try to show you that Jesus is not God. Because they will say that it is, he is the firstborn. See what the scripture says? He is firstborn of all creation. So what they're, saying, what they're trying to tell you is that he's not God. He's firstborn among humans. But Paul doesn't use the word that way. That's not what Paul intends to mean in this text. In fact, you know, if you know the Bible, you know Jacob was not born first. Esau was. But Jacob received the firstborn blessing. That's how God works sometimes, right? So what Paul is saying here is that Jesus is God. He's the first in rank, if you understand that. First in all things, he's God. Paul writes in chapter 2, all of chapter 2, giving warning to this church, giving warning to you, young people, to understand that, verse 4, you may not, they, they, the false teachers, may not delude you with plausible arguments. 
I'll tell you something. Just because someone sounds like they know what they're talking about doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. But some of the worst false teachers are the best speakers. And they sound like they know what they're talking about. They have a plausible argument. Right? They can argue like crazy. In fact, they practice arguing. All right? Me, personally, I don't like to argue. But they practice it. And they will try to delude you, trick you, fool you, deceive you. Verse 8. See to it, no one takes you captive. Think of it that way. Do you like to be a prisoner, or do you like freedom? Well, if you follow them, you will be taken captive by their philosophy and their empty deceit, according to human tradition, elemental spirits of the world, but not, most importantly, not according to Christ. So a conversation you must have with high school students and college students, you got to talk through all this. There's, I mean, there's a book written I read a long time ago, How to Stay Christian in College. Someone wrote a book! How to Stay Christian in College because they understood what's happening to young Christians going away to college. Their faith is going out the window. I've met parents who said that. College ruined my kid's faith. That's the conversation I've had with real people. And they continue to pray for their kids today, hoping that they will return to the faith. Another book I read a long time ago called Already Gone. You got high school kids? Well, the book is called Already Gone because when they graduate from high school, they're already gone. They are, you already lost them. Because they didn't grow roots when they were 15 and 16 and 17. They didn't believe the Bible was what we see it to be. We need to have conversations. And we need to have prayer for our, our students and the people we love and so that they can develop roots in God's words not empty philosophies. Young people are vulnerable, gullible, impressionable, and they will certainly take the word of a passionate professor over the book that's been written 2,000 years ago. So we must help them see that the word of God, the Bible, is written by someone who's way more passionate than any professor they'll ever have or any teacher. God's word still applies today. It's living breathing. It gives us spiritual understanding and wisdom, and within the church is where you grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. So they need epinosis, full knowledge, the whole truth. And the second part of your prayer is that they need power. And not just any power, they need resurrection power. Paul struggled. If you, if you read Paul, like if you read the epistles, you read the book of Acts, you see Paul struggle. Just a couple of weeks back in 2 Corinthians, we saw how much he physically was tortured for his faith. He suffered a lot. Now, you might have thought, I would think, in Paul's case, that many times he felt like he was about out of energy. Like there were times he probably thought to himself, I just can't do it. I just can't do another city. Can we just cut this short, man? I need to get some rest. But then he says this in Colossians 1.29. For this I toil, struggling with all... Whose energy? His energy. That he powerfully works within me. Paul clearly understood his power came from Jesus Christ, from the Holy Spirit within. That's where he got his power, his energy what about you? Is it different for you? Is Paul some kind of special saint? Right? That, that he gets his power from Jesus Christ and you don't get it from him the same way? No. He says in chapter 2, verse 12, you've been buried with Christ in baptism and you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. You can have resurrection power today. And you should have resurrection power. But don't misunderstand it. It's not so much a get up on a stage and, 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 and you know, put the spotlight on you. That's not necessarily resurrection power. In fact, you might think of resurrection power as being a very quiet power. When Jesus came out of the tomb on Sunday after he had been crucified and put in the tomb, did he come out? Were there fireworks going off? 
the tomb, and Jesus came out in this beautiful red, white, and blue robe? <laughs> no. It was quiet. He left the tomb quietly. Resurrection power is sometimes very quiet because God can do wonderful things when we don't care if we get the glory. And he gets the glory. So what might keep you from living with resurrection power? Maybe you're thinking to yourself right now, man, I would really like this resurrection power. I'd really like God to use me and speak through me. And I'd like to share my faith more and be bold in my faith. I'd really like that. I'd like to um, have um, victory over some of the sins that keep coming up in my life. How many of you are like that? You're thinking to yourself, I'd like that. I'd like a little more power, a little more self-control and, and all of that. Just a little show of hands if you're in that camp. Okay, i got a few people with me because I want that. I can always use some more power, some more self-control. Well, Paul says, back in Galatians, you got to crucify the flesh. It's the flesh wars. Not Star Wars, it's the flesh wars, right? you got to crucify, Galatians 5.24. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and its desires. And he repeats it again in Colossians 3.5. He says, put to death whatever is earthly in you, fleshly in you. What is that? Oh, sexual immorality, impurities, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. And honestly, all those isms that we talked about, those are of the flesh. You're trying to please God through what you can do. You can't. No special knowledge from angels, no self-denial or self-discipline, no philosophy, no meditation, no circumcision, no law, will ever give you the power that comes from Jesus Christ. It's not something you can manufacture yourself. You have to get it from the Holy Spirit. Paul had one major goal in life, he tells us in Philippians. Philippians 3.10. I, I couldn't help but think of this verse. I know we're not in Philippians, I know I'm teaching about Colossians, but Paul writes this in Philippians and it really sums it up. It sums up what his goal in life was. And maybe it's your goal too. He ultimately says, I want to know, what does he say? I want to know the power of the resurrection. That's what he says in Philippians 3.10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And then, of course, I'm going to share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Because when you live with resurrection power, you will be persecuted, as Logan said earlier. You will suffer for the gospel's sake. But I tell you, there's a greater life ahead of us in heaven. Living with resurrection power. Are you living with it? Are you living with the full knowledge? Those are two things that every Christian needs to have in this life, and especially our high school students and our college students. You need these. You need the full knowledge. You need spiritual wisdom and understanding. So I guess my application here as I wrap this up and, and my call to action for you is that you would just be in prayer for these young people in our church. And I know I'm probably going to miss somebody, but I just thought of these people as I was writing my notes, that we need to be praying for them. We have a really wonderful youth group that meets and encourages our youth, and um, I want to see that continue, but we need prayer. I mean, you pray for you know, Gabby Wright and Colin Floyd. They just graduated this year, and they're heading off. We need to be praying for them. We need to pray for Ellie and Ethan Trombley, my, our children, Sierra Kaufman, um, Kaylin and Tyler Nichols, Jenna Wright, uh, Chelsea Rademacher, Aben Sam Weisick, Mackenzie and Josh Shelnut, Vincent and Anna Andrews, Elisha Brockert, Michaela Dostel, Joey and Grace Haynes, Ashton Wilbraham. All of these are young people in our church that need your prayers. Pray for Logan, that he would continue to be bold in his faith. And pray for yourself, that you would have spiritual wisdom and understanding. And that you would have the full, full knowledge and resurrection.